The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. The beginnings of this project started out with a visit from my three-year-old granddaughter. She stopped by the office one day and was nosing around doing what little three-year-olds do, being curious and so forth. And she looks back in the corner of my office on the floor and she points to a box and she goes, Look, Paca, a treasure chest. And the excitement in her eyes was just something to behold. Now, I don't know if she was really caught up in the treasure chest, the box per se, because this was the box. It's the box for my Lamello biscuit joiner. Now, granted, I'm real proud of her that she thinks that a Lamello biscuit joiner is a true treasure. However, I don't think that would be quite appropriate for a three-year-old girl. But she was very excited. And I think just the mystique of a treasure chest really just brought out the excitement in her. So we went about figuring out what a treasure chest should look like, at least in an adult's mind, and came up with this project. Well, this is the treasure chest that we came up with. Now, as you can see, it looks a little bit more like a treasure chest. Uh, the light-colored wood for the field areas and the dark banding and so forth. And uh, keep in mind that this is a pirate's treasure chest. This isn't a fine piece of furniture or something like that. You want it to have a sense of history, adventure, and so forth. Uh, construction of it is fairly straightforward, but there are some great challenges in it. We're going to be doing a stave construction to create the curved top. We've got this applied walnut banding. Uh, there's just some different techniques in here that you may not be used to when doing fine furniture and so forth. Now the real important part of this project isn't the construction of it or even the treasure chest. For me, the final stage of this project is when I introduce it to my granddaughter. And we're going to set up a nice little adventure for it. And we'll give you some details on that at the end of the project. So without further delay, let's dive right in Let's start constructing this thing, and then when we're all done with it, we'll tell you a little bit about how you can have some fun with your child. The material that I selected for the treasure chest is going to be red oak. Now, I couldn't get half-inch thick material at my supplier, so the first step we need to do is prepare our material. The planer gave us two faces that were parallel to each other, but now we need an edge so that we can perform some of our ripping and cross-cutting operations. We want that edge to be square to the faces. The joiner is one of the best tools to do that. Now the last step that I like to perform for my stock preparation step is to get all the material into its rough overall length. Depending on the component and how much room I think I need to work, generally I'll leave my pieces about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch long at this step. But by breaking down the larger pieces into smaller, more manageable pieces, I can perform the subsequent machining operations more accurately. Now, because some of my boards are too wide to cross-cut at the compound miter saw, I like to use my sliding table. I'm finding more and more uses for this thing since we've gotten it here in our shop. Now we can get started on the lower portion of our treasure chest. Now because of its size, it'll be very easy to pick up material that's wide enough to make up all the front, back, and two side panels. However, this is a treasure chest. It should have a little bit of character. So what I'm going to do is rip my oak into strips and then join them back together again. 
And if I change the grain pattern around a little bit and break the rules that we would follow for fine woodworking, we should be able to add some nice character to this project. So I'll get started by ripping each of those strips now. Now the two end pieces in the front and back will be made up of three strips the way I'm making it. Two of the strips, the top and bottom one, will be two and five sixteenths wide, and the middle one will be two and three eighths wide. And that'll give us the proper overall height. Now what I'm doing is I'm just moving these little pieces around, following that dimensional layout, trying to find the layout that gives me the most character so that you can actually see the individual boards. With a nice edge grain to edge grain joint, I'm not going to get overly worried about putting in biscuits or any other type of reinforcement here. This joint will be plenty strong. So I'll just get some glue on the surfaces, clamp it up, and let these dry. Now that the glue's had a chance to set up, I've gone through and sanded my panels flat. Now, of course, I use my wide drum sander because I like its efficiency. Now what I want to do is go through, rip each of the pieces to make sure that they're at the appropriate seven inch width, and then we'll trim off the ends. Now our two side panels need to be cut off 19 inches long at the wide point near the top edge. And they get cut at a three degree miter at both ends. And that tilts in smaller towards the bottom. Our compound miter saw should make that job pretty easy. When ripping the lower panels for our case, we want to make sure that we rip that bevel on there. There's a small three degree bevel that's both at the top and the bottom of these side panels. So we'll get the saw blade tilted over at three degrees and make those rip cuts. Now with just the one edge beveled, I want to make sure that the long side or the long face is against the fence. Then we can just pass it through a second time and we should have our two three degree bevels on both the top and bottom of these side panels. Now before we cut these side pieces to their proper overall length for the lower portion of the treasure chest, you may want to assemble the staves that make up the top portion or the lid of our treasure chest. Now it's going to be somewhat difficult to control the width of the top piece because of that stave construction. So by assembling that first, by getting it all glued up, you can measure its width and then make your determination for the overall length of your side pieces on the lower portion, because that we can easily cut to any length. As you can see, I've got my front and back and two sides loosely assembled here on my workbench. What I'm doing is carefully measuring for the size of the bottom panel. Now that I've got my dimensions, we can go over to the table saw and cut that. Now you may be wondering why I don't make this cut over at my miter saw. My miter saw can't cross cut a nine inch wide piece, so the table saw is the best place to do it. Now you could use your standard miter gauge, but again I'm using my sliding table. It makes this type of cut very accurate. I'm getting ready now to assemble the lower portion of our treasure chest. And because these are all very basic butt joints, I do want to reinforce them because they are basically end grain to face grain butt joints. Now the biscuit that I want to use is a number zero biscuit. And I've made up this neat little template here that helps guide me as to biscuit selection. What I've done is I've just taken and cut a series of biscuit slots, a number zero, a number 10, and a number 20, into a piece of wood. Then I've taken that piece of wood and planed it down so that the slot is actually exposed. Now here we've highlighted the half moon shape with a black marker so that you can see it better. But this gives me a lot of information. And the one that I'm most concerned about right now is how deep into the side that the biscuit's going to go in. Because I obviously don't want to cut my biscuit slot so that it shows on the outside of the board. So with this handy little template per se, Here's my number zero biscuit, and it goes in approximately 5 sixteenths of an inch. Half inch thick material, we should be okay to use number zero biscuits. Now I'm going to place two number zero biscuits at each end between the sides and the bottom panel, and then two on each of the side pieces to the bottom panel. So I'll just evenly lay those out on these pieces. And with all the biscuit slots cut, 
of course it's time for a dry assembly. We always make sure we do a dry assembly because once we start applying glue, it's a little too late to fix any problems. We'll start out by getting some glue in each of the biscuit slots. Then we can start installing some of the biscuits. Now with the front on, we can bring in the back. Again, glue in the biscuit slots and a bead along the edge of the plywood. Bring that down and bring the back in place. And because of the slanted sides, it's going to take a little bit of messing around with the clamps to get them to draw the sides or ends in good and tight. Moving on to the top piece of the treasure chest, we're going to start out by ripping the pieces that will make up the two end panels. Now we need to cut those a little bit wide at this point because we're going to be, of course, cutting those on the bandsaw to get that radius on the top edge. But again, I do want that character look there, so rather than make it out of one piece, I'll rip a series of thin strips, so about two inches wide. Three pieces for each end panel should do the trick. The top of the treasure chest is going to be constructed in a stave construction type technique where we're going to bevel cut a series of boards to create that circular shape. Now the first two pieces that we're going to need on that just simply need to be square ripped or ripped at a 90 degree angle to the face, three quarter inch wide strips. We need two of those. To construct the top out of these staves we need to tilt our saw blade over at 15 degrees to make these ripping cuts. Now the material that we're using is going to be 11 sixteenths of an inch thick. So make sure you plane your material to the appropriate thickness. Now I do have my rip fence set a little bit wide for the first cut of each of the pieces. When we spin it around to do the second bevel cut on the other edge, we'll adjust the fence to get that dimension correct. Clamping up the staves that are going to make up the top of our treasure chest can be a bit of a challenge if you let it be. Realistically, all we have to do is hold all of these joints together fairly tight while that glue sets up. Masking tape is a good choice to tape together all of the staves. Now I've carefully laid them out flat on my workbench and then I'm taking masking tape, in this case two inch wide, and I get it attached to one of the staves at one end pull a little tension on it, and then press it down. And that'll actually give us a lot of holding force along the outer edge of our top. Now at this point, we only want the six staves that have been beveled. We don't want the two three-quarter inch strips yet. Those will be assembled a little bit later on. Now you do want to check everything to make sure it is the appropriate size. So roll it up and then measure across from the inside corner to the inside corner along these edges and it should be nine inches. And if I get just a little bit of tension on there it'll come in at nine inches. So we're good to go. Now what I need to do is get glued down on each of these bevel cuts and then we'll curl it back up, tape it, and let it sit. You do want to try to avoid getting a lot of glue up on these faces because once we roll it up it's going to be kind of hard to clean that area out. And now we can just put some tape across the outside edges like so. And of course I need to draw enough tension on there to make sure that I get my nine inch dimension. So I'm just going to get that on there, check it, and adjust if necessary. Once you get it taped up, you may want to throw a couple clamps on there to help stabilize it. But don't over clamp it because you'll start opening up the joints on the outside edge. Now that the glue's had a chance to set up on our first stage of assembly for the top, we need to attach these three quarter inch wide by half inch thick strips to each edge. And we want it to line up nice and flush along this inside face. That's why we couldn't attach it when we were taping together the outside edge because there will be this area hanging over that we need to trim up later. So I'm just going to apply a bead of glue and at this point you can make a determination how you want to clamp and affix this. Now you could tape it I suppose to help hold it in place. Um, you could even slide it around until the glue takes hold a little bit and then clamp it down against something flat. However, I'm going to drive in 
a couple of inch and a quarter brads to help hold it in place until that glue sets up. And we can clamp it down right on top of the workbench while that glue has a chance to set up. And there's just enough room to get your arm in there to clean out any glue squeeze out. After the glue dried up on our end pieces for the top, I've gone through, sanded the panel flat. I cut a three degree bevel along the bottom edge because these end pieces will tilt in on the top just as they do on the bottom. So we've got that surface qualified and I cut it off to length. Now I've gone through and taken the time to lay out the radius that we want to cut along this top edge. Now that radius is a five inch radius and it's centrally, the center of the radius is centrally located left to right on the panel and it's three quarters of an inch up from the bottom edge. So I made a mark there to locate my center, set my compass and drew out the line. Now the next thing I want to do is to place a 3 8 inch thick shim along this back edge here. And we'll just attach that there with some double face tape. And I'll explain what that's about in a moment. Now we know that we've got a 3 degree bevel along the bottom edge of our side piece. And we also want a 3 degree bevel along the top surface. But we don't want a 3 degree bevel here on the sides of our top piece. So if I were to just tilt my table up at three degrees, I, as I would be cutting around in this direction, I'd end up with a three degree bevel in this area. I really don't want that. All I want is that three degree bevel to be a perfect three degrees up near the top surface. By placing this three eighths inch thick shim down here, when my part is in this attitude, I'll end up with a three degree bevel up here. But when the part is in this attitude, I'll be cutting perfectly square to the table. So this allows me to get that diminishing bevel as we cut around our radius. So now it's just a matter of very carefully cutting along our layout line. The next step for our top is to cut it off to the overall length. And of course we need to tilt the sides in at three degrees while we make that cut. Now there are a couple of different ways you could do it. You could do a layout line all the way around the circumference and cut it with a jigsaw. Uh, you could sand it, perhaps even plane it, uh, working very carefully with hand tools. However, I've got this nice band saw here and it's got the riser in it so my part fits wonderfully underneath the guides. However, because of the open bottom, it's hard to stabilize it while we make that cut. Plus we need to keep it somewhat square. So we've come up with a very simple little jig and I'll show you that. If you've ever worked with the table saw, you most probably have constructed a table saw sled for doing cross cutting. Well, that's exactly what this piece is. Thin sheet of plywood, in this case scrap, here you can see some, some milling that we've done on it with our CNC router that we're prototyping. We've affixed a runner to fit in our miter slot. We then cut it off, attached a fence to it that's square to the edge that we just cut. Now we can place this on our table. We've got our table tilted at that three degrees. Now we can just simply lay our top on here and very carefully cut it off. Now I will caution you, if you're going to do your cutoff in this operation, you may want to take a series of test cuts to make sure that your blade tracks very accurately and gives you a nice straight cut. It'll be very difficult to get biscuits in here and to get the two pieces to line up. Now to reinforce this joint, you could use dowels if you wanted. Um, but what I'm actually going to do is just apply some glue over the surface. Then once we got it lined up nice, we're going to tack it in place with some one inch brads. Then using these fancy angle compensating clamps, I can clamp it up nice and we'll let that sit and dry. Well, now comes the laborious process 
of shaping the outside surface of our lid so that it's round and matches our end pieces. Now there's a number of different ways you could approach this. You could go through and use a belt sander or even your random orbit sander. It may take a while, but you can certainly shave it down that way. Hand plane's a great tool for this operation. Just take your time and work it down. And of course you can use the two end pieces as your template so you can work right down to that radius that we cut on these two end pieces. So I'll be at this for probably about an hour or so. Once I get it real close with my hand plane, I'll start some finished sanding. After about two hours of hand planing, I then went through and finished sanded all the oak pieces. I got my top nice and curved just the way I wanted it. Now at this point you do have to finish sand all the oak pieces before putting on the banding because it's going to be very difficult to sand that afterwards. Now as you can see I've already got started on the bottom portion of the treasure chest with the walnut banding. I've got it on one end and across the bottom. Now for that banding, as I mentioned, I'm using walnut veneer. Now this was some veneer that I had cut uh, here in the shop a number of months back. Uh, the board looked prettier than it actually was. After I got it into the veneer, I realized that it's not going to be of much value for a fine piece of furniture, but it's going to be perfect for this application. Now before we get into how to apply the veneer for our banding, let's take a look at a couple different techniques on how we can cut the veneer. One of the traditional tools for cutting veneers is a veneer saw. It has an offset handle and generally it's used with a, another block of wood that you use for a fence and then you hold the flat portion of the saw tight against that fence and then make a pulling cut. Now of course you would place your veneer underneath that fence and you're going to be cutting on a backer board of some sort. A scrap piece of plywood works very well. Now when making a cross cut or even a ripping cut, you do need to make a layout line so that you know where you want to cut to. So I've got my layout line on there and I'm going to use this piece of scrap oak. Line that up carefully with that layout mark. I'm going to press down very firmly on here because I don't want anything to slide while I'm making this cut. Just make a series of pulling cuts. And you'll end up with a nice clean square cut end. Doing the ripping operation, or what we would call a ripping operation, is done the same way. Now I'll end up cutting this piece off a little shorter to demonstrate that. Now again you'd need a layout mark on there and if you're doing a longer piece you would use a longer piece of stock for your fence. So we'll just lay that on there about like so and of course I would be lining that up with my layout mark and it's just a matter of taking a series of pulling cuts. You want to keep the, the saw as square and flat against your fence as you can. After you get done with your veneer saw, if needed, take a sanding block and clean up your edge. Now that's one technique using the veneer saw. You can also cut veneers on your table saw. Let me show you that technique now. Now here at the table saw is another technique for ripping and cross cutting thin veneers. Now generally this isn't too well accepted by the purists but it does work very well and I learned the trick or technique we should say from a fellow woodworker who's been doing marquetry for over a half a century. Now in this case there's a couple things that you have to be aware of. Now most fences ride high on the table saw's table. Now you want to make sure that your veneer won't slide underneath the fence. If it does, that's not a big deal. Just clamp an auxiliary fence onto your existing fence that sits flush on the table surface. And then of course you'll have to set your width accordingly. Now what does help this technique a lot, and you will need to have it, is a zero clearance insert plate so that there's minimal gap between the edges of the saw blade and the slot where the saw blade passes down through the table surface. 
Another very important aspect of this is to use these grippers or some other type of push block that is similar. And this allows you to hold down the veneer tight against the table surface and you'll notice that I've got one of my center blocks adjusted just to the edge of the blade. Now I'll be using two grippers hand over hand to feed the veneer through as I'm making the ripping operation. And it goes very easily. And as you can see, you get a nice clean rip out of this operation. And I'm using a carbide tip saw blade. Now this is a combination blade that's suitable for both ripping and cross cutting. If you're going to be doing this and you have a nice cross cut blade with a lot of teeth on it, that would probably work out much better. I've also found that cross cutting the veneers at the table saw also works very well using a very similar technique. Now I've got my miter gauge on the table saw with an auxiliary fence clamped to it. And of course I've passed that over to saw blade so I know exactly where my kerf cut is going to be. Now with my mark on my workpiece so where I want that cut to be I can line that up on my fence and then the only real trick to it is to take a scrap piece of stock lay that on top of the material to help hold everything down while we make the cut and then it's just like cutting any other material. And as you can see you can get a nice clean cross cut using this technique. Now as you can see I've gone through and cut the four pieces of banding that I'm going to use on the end. Now what I want to do is get these to fit up real nice where the joints are and I do want them to overhang a little bit on the edges. We can always sand that up flush. So by leaving it overhang about a sixty-fourth of an inch we can be assured of no gaps where the other piece will come up against it. So once I get these fit up real well then what I have to do is mask off this inside area. Now we're going to be using regular glue to glue this veneer banding down against the treasure chest. And we know we're going to get glue squeeze out. So by masking that area off, we don't have to concern ourselves with it and deal with it after it becomes a problem. Now here's a little tip for you. If you're going to be buying veneer, you may want to buy the uh, adhesive back veneer. That's a heat sensitive veneer. And then that way you can just put it in place, iron it on, and move on. And that'll save you a lot of work. With the bottom banding taped in place, I've then placed some masking tape along the top edge of that. Now I'll take one of my sides and again allowing it to overhang the edge a little bit. I'll line that up and then using a sharp knife, I'm going to cut that masking tape so it will be square in this corner. And I'll repeat this process all the way around. Start out by applying some yellow woodworking glue. Then just using my finger I'll spread it around and make sure I've got the surface thoroughly coated. Now we start lining up all the veneer strips. We can bump it right up against that blue tape. The blue tape makes it very visible where the yellow masking tape gets a little bit more hidden in there. It's hard to see it through the glue. Just carefully line that up and then tape it in place so it don't slide around on you. Now with everything lined up, I'll add a few more pieces of tape to help hold all the little pieces from sliding around. Now I'll put on a piece of wax paper and I'm using a router mat uh, to help distribute some of the clamping pressure. If this is an unevenly flat surface, if I were to clamp a flat board against here, it would only hit on the high points. By using the rubber mat, we can distribute that clamping force across this uneven surface. So now I'll clamp a backer board on there. And now we can let this sit in the clamps for about a half hour before moving on. The banding that goes on the end of the top, of course, has to be curved around like so. Now I started out, I didn't have my veneer wide enough with one sheet, so I very carefully jointed two pieces together, just simply using tape at this point. Then I cut the one end so it's nice and straight. What I want to do is just get this centered up on there so we've got an overhang on both edges. And we'll tape it in place for the moment. Now we can take a pencil and draw the outer profile that we need to cut the shape to. 
Now if you remember when we laid out the end pieces for the top, we had that radius that went around. It was three quarters of an inch up from the bottom edge and centered left to right. Well, we know that we want our banding to be an inch and a quarter wide. So I've set up a compass. I found my center point again. Set the compass to the appropriate radius and we can just simply draw that in. Now at this point we have our layout where we can make our inside radius cut and on the opposite side the outside radius cut. Now along the outside edge I want to make sure I leave the line. After it's glued in place we'll sand up the outside edge flush. On the inside edge we want to cut as close and as precisely as we can because we won't be able to really uh, trim that up after it's installed. So we'll cut it very carefully and sand it up nice and smooth. Now there's a number of different ways we can cut this shape. We could actually use a sharp X-Acto knife or a utility knife and very carefully cut that shape out. If you have a scroll saw, that's another option for cutting that. Here at the band saw, I've installed a fine tooth blade and what I call a zero clearance insert. It's nothing more than a scrap piece of quarter inch plywood that I've fed into the saw blade and made an auxiliary tabletop. Now I'll fold it in place. It's just fastened onto my standard tabletop with some double face tape. And that gives me a zero clearance underneath the saw teeth so that I get a nice clean cut around. And as you can see, I'm carefully sanding that inside curve. We want that, of course, to be nice and smooth. Now I've gone through, placed some masking tape on the end of the top taped my curved banding in place and now I want to make a nice cut line along this inside edge. Again this is just to deal with the squeeze out. Perhaps you've ever wondered how those auto body paint shops get such beautiful pinstriping and so forth. Well you're starting to get the idea. Ready for glue and clamps just like all the other pieces. Well as you can see I've been busy working on the banding. Now most of it's been done with basically ripping the inch and a quarter wide strips and then cutting them off to length. Gluing them in just as we did with the other pieces. Now we're getting up to a tricky part and we'll show you the details on that which will also help cover the information on how to do these bands that go over the top of the treasure chest. Now there's two cuts here and here that are a little bit tricky but they're nothing more than a basic three degree miter cut. We'll bring you in a little closer and show you that. The process that I followed, I placed my banding at the bottom and the top along the front edge as well as the back. And then because these sides tilt out at that three degree angle, I had to fit these pieces in by mitering both the top and bottom edges to a three degree bevel cut. Because I was doing it at the table saw, it was a very easy cut to do. The bands that fit along the top around this curved surface as well as the sides being slanted in present a few challenges but it's really not that difficult. Now again I'll mention that these are just basically inch and a quarter wide strips for the inside bands and they were just cut to length and clamped in place. We'll show you that clamping operation in a moment. There's a couple of marks you'll want to make coming from each end on the top. The first mark is one and a quarter inches down and the second mark is one and five eighths inches down. Now for our first step when fitting in this banding will be to line up on this mark. The final shape for that end banding piece is this curved or crescent shaped piece. It's fairly easy to actually lay out and it starts out by first ripping a piece of material of your veneer that's about an inch and seven eighths wide because we need a little bit oversize as we scribe in the shape that we want it to end up being. Now I've taken my 1 and 7 eighths inch wide veneer strip, lined it up with my mark that's 1 and 5 eighths of an inch down, taped it in place, and clamped it in place. Now of course I've got a nice square end on this point to start with. Now what we want to do is two steps at this stage of the game. We can draw the banding around, just rotating it around, and lining it up with our 1 and 5 eighths inch mark down here. Then we can find how long we want to cut this piece off to. Once we get that established, we can then trace around this inside curve in this area with a pencil, and then we can go over to the bandsaw and cut that shape. And while we got it all clamped together, let's trace that inside shape. 
Now I will admit on this walnut it's kind of hard to see the pencil line, but it does work out pretty well. Now with the veneer strip cut to length and fit in place, we can cut that curve that fits up with the outside edge. Now with that outside edge cut to width, what we want to do is tape and clamp the strip back in place and sand that up relatively smooth. Now using a compass, I've set the points so that they're an inch and a quarter apart. And if you've ever scribed in a cabinet uh, against a wall, the process is the same. Carefully ride the pointer on the outside edge of our chest and just draw around. And that will give us a nice parallel line for us to cut at the bandsaw. Now with our strip completely machined, what we want to do is make sure we sand up that edge that fits along the inside surface here, very smooth. So we're just taking a sanding block and carefully working around it. Well, now that we've got it all fitting up very nicely, what we want to do is apply some masking tape along this edge, and then we can glue it up. Now I'm getting ready to dry assemble for the last time to make sure everything fits up real good. But I would like to point out something that applies to a step much earlier on. And that had to do with when we were uh, planing this top into that curved shape, as well as when we sand it. Make sure that you don't either plane right up to the edge, because this is end grain, so if you plane right to the edge, you'll be breaking that out. Also, if you're sanding it, don't allow it to run over. We want a nice, sharp, flat surface here, so that this strip will butt up nice against that surface. Now, I've gone through and placed some masking tape underneath where this strip is going to go. And what I want to do is get this strip in place, clamp it in place, and then I can take a sharp knife and trim away the masking tape to conform to the shape of our banding. Get your glue applied, and then using tape on the ends of the veneer, bring the end into position, tape it, and you may have to clamp it as well. And draw it around, tape the other end. And now with it in position, we'll add some tape to help hold everything from sliding. Now I'll throw another clamp across this way to help hold the veneer in place while I remove these other two clamps. Then I'm going to slide a band clamp up. Band clamps are great for this application. Once we get a little tension on the band clamp, we can remove the other clamp, center up our band on our veneer strip, and then it won't hurt to throw another clamp with soft rubber pads right on the ends where the veneer butts up against the other component. Now I've found that if I let this glue sit for about a half hour, and I'll see where the squeeze out looks like it's just starting to get hard, kind of in that area where it turns a little bit translucent. Then if I remove my band clamp and all the tape, everything cleans up real nice. If I wait until that glue completely hardens in that squeeze out area, getting the tape off can be a bit of a challenge. Now after the banding's been applied, I've gone through and detailed it out. And that just requires some sanding, making sure that there aren't any sharp edges and so forth. And now we're ready for some finish. Now, this particular treasure chest has an intended purpose that's going to be involved with an adventure. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, depending on the application of how you want to use your treasure chest, select an, a finish that's appropriate. Now, mine will be used by a young child, so I'll be using a, a safe finish on it. There's a variety of them. You can use mineral oil. Another good one is a, a product called Salad Bowl Finish that's food safe, so you're sure it's uh, child safe as well. I don't think that a high gloss or a high buildup type finish would be appropriate for this project. Now, this particular brand of oil finish suggests that you wipe it on liberally. So I'm using a heavy duty shop towel to wipe it on. So I'll get a good wet coat on there. Then they say let it soak in for about 10 minutes or so and wipe off the excess with the dry rag. Now because this is a porous wood, you may have to wipe it down a number of times. 
that oil will probably try to seep out of the pores of the wood as it dries out. So be aware of that. After the finish dries on your treasure chest, you'll want to go to the hardware stores, home centers, and even woodworking stores to pick out some appropriate hardware. As this is a pirate's treasure chest, highly polished, fancy brass hardware is probably not appropriate. For the hasp, we've got a very simple antique brass fitting there. The handles that we've selected are mission style drawer pulls. The small size, but they look very appropriate for this project. In fact, I wish we would have found some of this mission hardware for the hinges as well as the hasp. And for the hinges, we've got some relatively fancy antique brass hinges. Just pick out what you think is appropriate for your project to finish it off. Now all the candy and toys and jewels that we put inside this treasure chest are only part of the excitement. Now as I mentioned before, this is a treasure chest, so there should be some sense of adventure with it. So what I'm going to do is take the time to make up a neat little treasure map. I'm going to hide the treasure chest at some place around the house, perhaps out in a wooded area in the backyard, up in an attic, down the basement, out in the shop. Just hide it real well. And of course, the treasure map will be that guide to get us to the pirate's treasure chest. We'll invite the granddaughter over for a weekend, and we'll go on our treasure hunt. And of course, we'll make it fun and exciting for her, probably just as exciting for me as well. And then of course, when we find the treasure chest, she'll be just thrilled with all the neat little toys and so forth that are inside the treasure chest. The chest she's probably not going to be too thrilled about, but I'm sure all the contents will really make it exciting for her. Now, because this is such an interactive and fun project to do, I invite all of you to send us photographs of your treasure hunts. We'll put a special place up on our website, and we'll keep those pictures posted up there for all to see. I hope you have as much fun with your treasure hunt as I know I'm going to with mine. I'm Chris Dayhut, otherwise known as Paca, for Woodworking at Home magazine. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.